My name is Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with talented and interesting individuals linked to the global Indian and South Asian community. It's informal and informative, adding insights to our evolving cultural expressions, where each person can proudly say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Hi, everyone. On this episode of Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing, a conversation with the Dean of Harvard Business School, Srikant Datar. Stay tuned. So, you know, up to this point in my adult life, I've been grateful enough to get a medical degree, practice, teach, and learn as a pediatrician, help together with my wife to raise a family, and engage professionally with among the most talented people in the world. And speaking of talent, thank you so much for listening to this and sharing it with your friends and family, for rating, downloading, and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts, and for following Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing on social media at Dr. Abhay Dandekar. Now, for me, one of the things I've been so passionate about is, of course, to share conversations with interesting and talented people linked to the global Indian and South Asian community. And so in presenting this podcast, I've truly had to harness some skills that I've been developing over a long time in listening, empathy, problem solving, humility, and mentoring through learning. A lot of things from experiences that I've had in academia and in medical practice or other institutions, and also mainly just from life. But I've equally had to revive some dormant skills or develop new ones in business and entrepreneurship and understand personal leadership from a fresh lens especially as all of these skills in 2023 are important to integrate in a rapidly evolving world that grapples with so many challenges and opportunities. So it was simply wonderful to share a conversation with Professor Srikant Datar, the Dean of Harvard Business School. Srikant is from Mumbai originally and was a distinguished scholar and accountant before immigrating to the U.S. He received master's and doctorate degrees at Stanford before a celebrated career in academics that spanned over nearly 40 years. Srikant's expertise and research have also been in the areas of machine learning and AI, cost management, business strategy, design thinking and innovation, and of course, management education. Since becoming Dean of Harvard Business School about two years ago, he's navigated the school through a pandemic and helped conceptualize and execute strategy in priority areas for its students, its faculty, its alumni, and the global community at large. We chatted about a broad variety of topics this winter as I was grateful to catch up with him. And we started by reflecting a bit on the message he had shared with his latest entering class of students. You know, I I read that this last class, when you welcomed the students, you were asking what kinds of differences that they wanted to make in the world and then what kind of differences the world wanted them to make. And I was curious about that. So I wanted to ask you now, in 2023, as an educator, as a leader, what kinds of differences does the world actually want you to make? Great uh, question, uh, Abhay, and one that, uh, you know, we uh, speak a lot about because, uh, as you know, uh, the mission of the Harvard Business School is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. That's what we orient our entire um, Uh, research activity around our uh, teaching and uh, academic activities around. So it's all how do we train individuals to make a difference in the world. And I think the world is in very desperate need of leaders, always has been. It's always been the case that having good leadership matters a lot. And we know this is true, whether you're talking about leading countries or leading organizations or leading small teams. uh, Leadership plays a very important role. You know, one of the things I did uh, at the start of my appointment in January of 2021 was precisely go out and ask that question. What is Mm -hmm. it that the world expects uh, uh, of leaders today? So that as we think about that, Harvard Business School could uh, play an important role in developing those leaders. And you probably know from my background that uh, part of my work is in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I actually uh, did most of these interviews, uh, captured most of it digitally, uh, yeah. uh, did some uh, AI on it so that I would remove any biases in my thinking sure. about what it is that uh, people are telling me. Otherwise, you tend to hear more what you want to hear rather than what people are saying. And so that led to, I think, three major 
ideas that emerged. One was how should we think about the rapid pace of digital and technological change that is occurring in the world and it's only just beginning. So if I think about digital transformations now or if I think about cloud computing or if I think about machine learning and AI, those are big changes and they've just started. But there is more to come. You know, you think yeah. about metaverse and you think about uh, Web 3.0 and you think about quantum computing, edge computing. It's going to keep accelerating at a very uh, fast pace. And the question that then arises is how should we think about leadership in such a context uh, where there is such rapid change taking place in technology? And of course, that's a very important topic. It's a big topic, but it brought us into thinking about what we might do around people connecting with each other, and but also about ethics and privacy and bias and security and how should we, because leaders will have to think about these tremendous benefits that will come. I don't think any industry will escape uh, the way of digital uh, and technological transformation that is taking place. It's no longer only for technology companies, it's for everyone. Yeah. Second was around, you know, I've always argued for, and maybe people would expect that as a dean of the business school, but I genuinely and firmly believe this, that Business has been a source of tremendous good for society over millennia. If you think about ways in which we have improved our standard of living, if we think about ways in uh, which people have been lifted out of poverty, if you think about ways in which uh, terrific jobs have been created, they've come from innovation, free enterprise, entrepreneurship, things that uh, are, I think, uh, deeply human in some sense. But as society is uh, facing some very significant challenges, what does it mean to be a business leader in such a world? Yeah. And that became another major, major topic for us to think about how we would make a difference. And then the third, of course, as the pandemic uh, took hold, was the future of work and what should we do uh, in the future of work. So those were the yeah. three areas where we thought we'd make a difference. Well, I, I, and for you, as in, in the outlook of thinking about these three themes that were generated from the discovery in, in gathering some of this data, did that in some ways kind of lead to a transformation of your own work in, in really shepherding these three priorities, perhaps for your own leadership style and your own leadership development? You know, one thing I like to say, um, particularly in academic leadership, uh, by uh, maybe different uh, than other leadership uh, arenas, you know, academic leadership is all, in my view, about servant leadership. It's about how do you have an amazing set of individuals in our community. So whether you're thinking about faculty members, or you're thinking about students, or you're thinking about staff, or you're thinking about alumni, all part of our community, how do you get them to be the best that they can be? That's what yeah. I think at the end of the day, academic leadership is uh, is about. I, maybe a little different uh, than others, but I think of academic, the best academic leaders that I admire are always being servant leaders. They've been ones who have thought about how do you get others to be the best that they can be. And you always do that in leadership, but you you in academia, you do it in a way by which... Uh, it's almost magnified. And magnified yeah. and develop them. Yeah. And what we did, uh, Abai, was launched uh, two uh, new institutes, uh, as you're asking about how that was transformation for us. And it was a transformation. We've never had institutes of this type before at Harvard Business School. One is what we call D-cubed. Uh, the first D, D stands for digital and technological transformation. The second D for data science and machine learning and AI. And the third D for what we call design thinking, the idea that at the end, uh, you know, whether you're designing a business model, whether you're designing an operating model, you're designing it for people. One yeah. should never lose the, the, the human side of that equation, uh, even as we are thinking about it, because I think it's going to become very important uh, to be a leader in a world filled with this much technology as to how do you uh, maintain that uh, the human contact and the human uh, inspiration, because at the end, that's, of course, what will cause all these great outcomes to come. 
Uh, and the second was an institute that we uh, call BIGS. Uh, it's the Institute for the Study of Business in Global Society, where we think about globalization and the impacts on different societies together. That's why global society. But we also think about the challenges that are that we are currently facing and why we believe that whether it is uh, climate change and climate tech or whether it is... Uh, 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 you know, creating opportunities for people who may not have had the benefit of going to college uh, and therefore creating good for both business because you're expanding the pool of talent available to business right. as well as good for society because you're giving opportunity to people to uh, grow and develop is, uh, of course, a very powerful uh, 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 benefit that we can get for both business and society. So we created those transformational uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunities, activities, if you will. And as I like to say in many of uh, uh, my talks to alumni and others, uh, you know, some of it comes, of course, from one's uh, background and uh, experiences. So my father was uh, very much involved in the freedom struggle and therefore we grew up with a lot of Gandhiji's sure. uh, teachings and uh, you know, I always uh, remind myself that uh, Gandhiji's seven deadly sins, at least three or four of them directly apply to us. Never do science without humanity. Never do commerce without morality. Never develop knowledge without character. And don't think about pleasure without conscience, besides, of course, all the other important three. But those, I think, directly apply to our work. And, and, I, and I know that the, uh, these priorities have led to a strategy of the institution. And, and I wanted to ask about that. You know, the, the past three years have, have been so globally transformational, particularly for systems and societal frameworks. Do you think people these days have faith in traditional institutions in 2023 the same way that they had in the past, especially in an era of very democratized knowledge discovery uh, connection and, and even the spirit of disruptive innovation. Um, what is the outlook, perhaps, from your mind when you talk to people, perhaps not even associated in academia, when it comes to institutional thoughts and and their trust and faith in institutions? You know, it's a it's a great question and a and a and a very important one for all the reasons that uh, that you're describing. One can think about businesses and companies as institutions. And uh, as I said uh, earlier, the idea of free enterprise and the good that it creates is a very important institution, therefore, to maintain because of the benefits it provides to society. So I, if I think about it that way, you know, extremely valuable. Sure. The question that you asked about, there is something called the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer that is put out every year. And the latest one looks at you know, among different institutions, you know, you can think about government, uh, you can think about not, uh, NGOs, you can think about business. Which are the institutions that uh, today people trust in the most? And it turns out that today business is the one that is actually trusted very highly. And they dig a little deeper to try and understand why that is. And I think the best we can conclude from the work they've done is the reason behind it is the ability of business to actually deliver and to actually execute and to actually get things done. You know, people mm. value that. But what that does is exactly what you were asking about earlier. It now further increases the the, the expectations that uh, people have from that institution and therefore... Right all the questions that we were discussing earlier around the role that business can play in addressing some of these important social issues and social challenges. And so I think it's very important to uh, have these institutions because even as we are democratizing a lot of the, the, the knowledge and so on that you were talking about, by the way, which I think is a very important trend and move, I think fundamentally institutions continue to play an important role in the functioning of economic activity. And so I can't imagine any of this economic activity working very well without a well-functioning government, right. without a well-functioning judiciary, without a well-functioning institutions and organizations. And yes, there will always be some give and take about how far and how deep, but uh, you know, we have to do this. 
I, I was just going to mention that, uh, you know, not very long ago, we had the launch of BIGS, you know, our Institute for the yeah. Study of Business and Global Society. And uh, we invited Satya Nadella to come and uh, inaugurate, to give the first talk and, and, and launch the Institute here. And Satya described very beautifully why, if you're thinking of long-term economic growth and long-term success of a business, those are very, you creating the right value, making the right economic decisions, very important. But he said that Microsoft thinks about it, it thinks about four factors that they must think about as they are making these decisions. And I think it's exactly on your question. Yeah. First, it has to be inclusive. Don't, uh, you're not going to have that long-term growth unless you're inclusive. Second, you must respect fundamental rights, human rights and and through it, institutions. You know, you can't weaken institutions in that process for the reasons that I was just describing earlier. Sure. Third, you've got to think about the environment. And fourth, interestingly to your question, are you taking actions that increase the trust that society has in your company? Right. And if you just think about those aspects and think about why, even as we are thinking about these particular issues, institutions matter, you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. After a quick break, we'll come back to our conversation with Dean of Harvard Business School, Shrikant Datar. Conversation. It's the antidote to apathy and the catalyst for relationships. I'm Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with global Indians and South Asians, so everyone can say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. New episodes weekly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hi, I am Congressman Sri Thanedar, and you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing by Abhay Dandekar. Welcome back to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's rejoin our conversation now with Professor Srikant Datar. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the frameworks that we still require, we still need. There are some foundations that help, in fact, to bring about great disruption. And then thinking about inclusion and certainly respect and, and about the environment around us, about trust that Mr. Nadella also frames. I wonder how that translates back particularly to the, the workforce, right? Because, you know, the workforce has seen such mobility and resignations over these past several months and, and in this kind of new era. And you've talked about leaders cultivating careers more than jobs. How have you been able to make this distinction in your own journey as a academic leader, as a business leader? I think two or three things that uh, I would say as you're thinking about, uh, thinking about careers rather than jobs. And uh, uh, by the way, at some level, this these set of issues come up in many other business decisions is the short term is immediately your job and the longer term is how do you think about the uh, career and i think you can always do your particular job very well and you can say okay that's what i'll do and that'll help me build a career but i think there are at least a couple of issues that i would say you know you think about a little differently as you're thinking about your career than your job one is this desire to always learn. And I think if I think about what we try to do as educators is not only teach a body of knowledge, which is of course important at a particular point in time, but how do you build and inculcate the joy of learning so that you have the skill of learning how to learn? Because if you have that skill, it's such a powerful uh, way of, having great joy in many activities that you that you undertake as well as building that curiosity which is i think the second thing i would say in these uh, in building these careers this curiosity the desire to uh, learn something that you didn't know and that you uh, feel some of it even for its own sake abhay it's not even you know it's not even calculated it's just just the joy of uh, joy of doing it and then the other is, the second is, of course, as you're thinking about your careers, the ability to 
you know, this is where I think your leadership uh, point that you were asking me about earlier comes in. Your ability to inspire others, your ability mm. to work together with somebody else as a team, your ability to see around corners so that you can have a vision that is, uh, you know, valuable and helpful. Those are skills that don't just stay at the level of the job. They kind of, you know, help you much more in terms of a career and they help you in terms of, uh, again, building trust with others and uh, help you in terms of, you know, building your own values and, and character as you're doing it. Because those things then start becoming more important as you think about your career than as a job. I mean, we're all, uh, uh, I think, underlying all of that is uh, humility. I think at the end right. of the day, uh, none of this can happen unless you are humble. Humble to know that you don't know everything. Humble to know that there are other people around you who are much smarter than you are, who can uh, help you. Humble to appreciate that, you know, there'll be very many different points of view that you should be open to listening to and learning from. So I think building careers involves much more than just having excellence in a particular job. Uh, there are so many elements of all of our identities. And in, in your case, being an immigrant, being a proud Indian American and a person of color, are there elements of these particular aspects of your identity and roots that actually bleed into your leadership style or even perhaps into your own daily routines as you navigate through academia and, and in this kind of leadership space? So... I think it's another interesting question and certainly I wouldn't say I've given that a, a great uh, deal of thought, but it obviously always is at the, you know, at the back of one's mind as uh, you do it. I would say Abhay, that the essentials of leadership, I think, remain the same. It doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you know, some of what I was telling, talking about earlier. Yeah, it's agnostic, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. How do you inspire people? And I... Uh, said a few words in my last commencement address uh, uh, to the graduating class that, you know, one of the ways in which I think about uh, leadership is your role is how do you enthuse, enable and empower uh, everyone in your organization to use their full range of talents. That at the end of the day will always be a, a central part of what you do as a as a leader. And so at some level, I think the essentials of leadership uh, remain the same, regardless of whether you're a person of color, immigrant, uh, whatever. But of course, as I was saying earlier, some of the leadership styles come from one background and experience. And, you know, I was describing to you how given my background and uh, my parents' uh, teachings and, you know, the influence that Gandhiji had on a lot of our thinking. And so, yeah. but that's, again, I could imagine someone else not being a person, immigrant or person of color, also getting inspiration from some of those uh, things. So it's, again, it's just this breadth of experience that you're trying to, you know, bring together. But I think the, I would say that, uh, you know, as, you, as you're thinking about the leadership styles, and again, in academia particularly, I've, we've been very privileged, I think, in that respect, that it, uh, it has been a, a very open academic uh, system certainly yeah. in the in the united states and so i've always felt the ability to work hard and be recognized for your own uh, skills and talents is something that the ecosystem in which we live automatically uh, uh, supports or automatically uh, helps because it's uh, i think the, it's it's more the norm than it might be the exception so it's something that it's always sure. been uh, one where we've attracted talent from all over the world and so I, i'd say that you know for the most part it's uh, consistent you take uh, a few lessons from d different experiences that you've had and you just benefit from the ecosystem in which you live you know and and there's so much duality it's 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 sort of baked in as Indian Americans, a lot to who you are that, that certainly is more on in your inner voice, but certainly the, the skills that you have as a leader, the skills that you are certainly learning every day, they're, they're definitely agnostic perhaps to, to some of the things that are part of your identity. I, I wonder though, that given those dualities, right? You're, you come from a family of academics, there's certainly a lot of drive and, and importance to education Yet, again, being an immigrant, being a person of color, do any of these things perhaps make your empathy levels change? Does it give you a different lens, particularly when you address 
inequality or gaps in equity at all? Has, has that offered many, a, any other elements to perhaps or a twist to the work that you do? Uh, so I would say uh, that definitely uh, does affect because you just see it. Your your experience growing up is uh, is a little different. I, you know, one of the one of the areas that I was uh, talking about earlier, uh, and one that we're doing a lot of work on is what's called the One Ten Initiative. This is an initiative launched by two amazing individuals, Ken Chenault and Ken Frazier, together with Ginny Romiti, the former CEO of, of IBM, and Kevin Scherer, the former CEO of Amgen. So there are a lot of individuals involved in this. One stands for 1 million, 10 stands for 10 years, and the initiative is one where they want 1 million black, and it'll extend later to underrepresented minority individuals to have, earn living wage jobs in corporate America in 10 years. So that's where the 110 word comes from, yeah. uh, with none of these individuals having a college degree. So they're all all individuals who don't have a college degree. And I look at that, and we are the first academic partner to the 110 initiative, and we're yeah. doing a lot of research and case writing and support uh, for what we might do, how we might help this initiative, because... I think of that, and and it comes back to the question that you were asking, is one where talent in this world is much more evenly distributed than opportunity. Uh, There are plenty of individuals who have amazing talent, but never had the opportunity, either because of family circumstances or where they were born or how they were brought up to ever go to college. And if business and society can we create win-win situations which is what we're thinking about in this uh, institute that i was describing this is an example where if we can actually identify and develop that talent then get companies to understand that the job descriptions that they have are such that they are limiting the access to talent because many times a company will put in its description that you need a college degree but actually for the skills and the democratization of knowledge that you were talking about earlier You actually don't need a college degree. Sure. And if they could then get access to this huge pool of talent and can develop that talent, what a great win that would be for for business and for creating terrific jobs and creating as well as developing and giving opportunity to a lot of people who uh, have not had that opportunity for circumstances. We are probably a little more attractive tuned to that and I'm often asked why I believe what I just said and I said you know it's in, I am a hundred percent certain that I could have been born to the same parents uh, exact same person 20 miles away or 50 miles away from where I was and I wouldn't even know that there was a university like Harvard University mm. I wouldn't even be aware of it uh, so that empathy that you see about you know the fact that luck has played such a huge role in our lives not that we haven't worked hard yeah. but that luck has played such a huge role in our lives and then how do you think about uh, creating those opportunities for others who may not have been as lucky as uh, we have been you're listening to trust me i know what i'm doing after a quick break we'll come back to our conversation with dean of harvard business school shrikant datar Every story told is a lesson learned, and every lesson learned is a story waiting to be told. I'm Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with global Indians and South Asians so everyone can say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. New episodes weekly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hi, this is Tony Khan, the owner of All Elite Wrestling, AEW, Fulham Football Club, and the Jacksonville Jaguars of the NFL. And you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Welcome back to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's rejoin our conversation now with Professor Shrikant Datar. You you know, you're about to start your third year as Dean of the Harvard Business School. So first off, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. What is, I'm I'm so curious as, as trying to dig into this past two years and embarking on your third year now. What has been perhaps the most surprising lesson that you've learned about yourself or that's even perhaps caught you off guard a little bit these past two years? You know, perhaps the most surprising, Abai, has been the, uh, I'll say say two things uh, uh, to your point. 
I think most surprising to me, and I say this with uh, great humility, is the expectations that the world has for the school and management education in general. You know, they're very high. I always thought they were high, but they are really very high. People yeah. do expect that uh, given the, the, uh, the, where we are, the benefits that we've had, what is it that we can do for the world? And so that expectation is, 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 is extremely high, as it should be. Yeah. And on the other side is just being so humbled by the impact that our alumni have on the world. And mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we are known as being very successful business uh, uh, executives and entrepreneurs and founders and financiers and all that. Sure. But if you look at what our alumni do in supporting hospitals, in supporting schools, in playing roles in their communities, in uh, helping everyone through their skills and talents uh, make the world a better place, make a difference. You know, that has been, I, I would say, both inspiring as well as, mm. uh, you know, I wouldn't say surprising you, you knew that, but you don't know it to the same extent that you do when you become dean and you, you observe it. And then on the other side, if I think about what was surprising from uh, in my two years as dean from the institutional side, so this is sort of from the external side and the impact we have on the world, how inspired our community is, and when I say community, I'm talking about faculty, students, staff, and alumni, about making a difference in the world. So mm. when you, in, a, in difficult circumstances, put out you know, goals that, are, are are bigger than what they might have originally looked. So you take an idea and you make it bigger and you wonder, should I do that or should I not? Because will it uh, will people be able to will have the energy to uh, to actually execute on it? And you learn very quickly that those kinds of the because people are so driven by the mission, they actually you, by by setting those goals you actually create energy you actually yeah. generate energy you actually create enthusiasm so this was i think a learning for me both in terms of leadership as well as understanding at least this amazing institution that when you take an idea and make it bigger you know it's it's uh, it's people rise to the occasion and and do it and if I then think about why that is the case is because I think this entire community that uh, that I was just describing puts the school ahead of themselves. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, a very key, key, key trait. If you can always think about what's best for the school first and then work as a team and have fun in the process of doing it, you end up, you know, getting more things done in more fun ways in more right. fulfilling ways than uh, if you did not. In that it sort of is a source of energy, it seems like, Correct. where, you know, it sort of it builds upon itself. And I, I wonder if it's easy to suss out when either members of the team or even in yourself that you find yourself becoming or visibly when the humility starts to fade. You know, the uh, importance of humility can't be overstated. Yeah. But I'm curious whether the success and the achievements does that actually breed humility and therefore then make everything that much more rich and diverse in, in that success? If that makes some sense, is it easy to understand and appreciate when, hmm, sounds like there is a veer away from that humility or, or it seems like we're, we're starting to stray perhaps from having that kind of humble centered compass? Yeah, no, I, I, and I think you always want to, at the, at the root of it, uh, always uh, uh, go back to, uh, you know, community values. And uh, we speak a lot about those uh, uh, here. And, you know, I think of the school as, you know, probably among the, the most humble academic institutions that are there. And people always look at me with a little puzzle as to why I'm saying that. And to understand that, I think we need to recognize that when we use the case method, which is what we use for our teaching, what are we really saying? We're really saying that there are so many smart people out there in the world who are doing amazing experiments. They're trying something different, whether 
it's in your role in, in, in your medical profession or whether it is in a company or in a business, they're trying something different. Yeah. We ought to recognize that if we can learn from them about what it is. So when we write cases, we're really learning from them about what it is that they're doing and what dilemmas they faced and then bring it to the, to the class. We're not saying we know all the answers. We're not saying we know everything that, that, that there is to know. And if you can keep that learning mindset, so we're trying to learn, learn, learn from everybody else all over the world, such such amazing people doing uh, such uh, different things. And then when we come into the class, we don't lecture. You know, we, we yeah. ask students to participate. We ask them to discuss. We guide and orient and make sure that the, the discussion is productive. Of course, that's our role as a, yeah. as a faculty member, but we're not giving lectures. So we neither lecture nor do we say, I know everything, and so here's the lecture that we give. I think it's therefore very much in, innate to uh, this culture and this institution that we have tremendous amount of respect for uh, what people outside do and tremendous and value it greatly and have, I think, over many, 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 uh, uh, you know, now it's 114 years, getting, getting towards 115th year, always tremendously valued what uh, people on the outside can teach it, us. It, it certainly sounds like a curious exploration is the vehicle of that humility. Correct. Correct. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, and you have expertise in this from your, from your research and from your background, but, you know, it certainly takes people to create machine learning tech and to scale it. And it takes people, again, to bring design thinking instruments to solve problems. But how do you bring these essential elements of 21st century business to a global population where the overwhelming majority may never actually have the opportunity to synthesize and digest and learn this kind of knowledge? So it's a great uh, question I, I, I asked. I was mentioning earlier, Rabbi, that we are engaged in this digital transformation uh, yeah. at the school. At, by the way, at the university. And one of the major projects there is what's called a new learning experience platform. We call it LXP. And the idea of the LXP is can we take all this knowledge that we have created and be able to offer it to individuals who will never step foot on the Harvard Business School campus or the Harvard University campus. So today we should be thinking about how do we reach, uh, because if our, our, our mission is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. There are many leaders who are making a difference in the world who might benefit from what you just said, or whether it's machine learning, design thinking, sure. or leadership development, or negotiation, or marketing, or whatever. And what can we do to enable that knowledge to be uh, spread? That is a major activity that we are uh, uh, engaged in. I think we'll do it with certain ground rules, which is we will only do it at a using some of the pedagogies that we deeply hold dear. So it should be participant centered. It should it will be case based. It will be community centric. How do you bring communities of learners together? Right. And we'll have to do all of this asynchronously because if you do it synchronously, it immediately cuts down the the scalability of these ideas apropos your question how do you reach sure. it we have run some very interesting experiments already to show that this is possible i have for instance my uh, a, a course on on design thinking that is offered online which currently can be taken by hundreds of people at a time because i don't have to be in the in the class it's designed in a way yeah. so the two things we look for and the staff that have developed the, uh, these kinds of courses is truly amazing. It's a very special skill that they that they have. But the two th things that we look at whenever we are going to do this, and I, I would expect that not only us, but all educational institutions will begin to think about right. uh, this as an important next step in the evolution. So how do you combine digital and pers in-person learning? One, it must have excellence in what we do. And as I said, it, we will hew closely to what uh, we believe as important aspects of our learning model and secondly it must have impact and that's what we'll measure we'll see if right. after you look at this does it have impact does it actually change how people do it we will learn we'll again you know with a, a careful thought think about uh, we'll make mistakes we'll correct them we'll uh, move it forward but the vision is very much in the direction that you're saying that 
and the digital transformation effort is one that should enable us or help us move in that direction. Yeah, and I, I think of the those emerging leaders in the rural worlds, whether they be in India, Africa, uh, even uh, you know here in the Americas, uh, being able to take advantage of these things. Uh, one quick thought in that, you know, these obviously I, I'm hearing your the tone and the temperature of these thoughts. They're, they are brought with such energy, and you mentioned the word joy earlier. You know, there's a, a joy that you have as a, a leader and a joy that you have as an educator. And I'm curious, what are those things that bring you joy that are harmonized both together, both as an educator and a leader? What brings you joy, particularly when you think about those uh, streams or arena of your of your current life? So... Interestingly, I think it's uh, the underlying uh, elements of joy are the are the same, which is uh, you know what gets you joy as a as a teacher is always 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 you know that spark that you suddenly see in a student's eyes that they learned something that they thought was very difficult to learn and the thrill that you yeah. get and that of course I saw from my father when he was an educator himself and I would see the reaction his students would have long after they had uh, been taught by him. And you get that in the classroom, you get that afterwards. There's just the joy of imparting your knowledge to somebody else is a particular privilege. And uh, you know, my father would always say it's the noblest of all professions, you would probably <laughs> argue. And uh, my grandfather being a doctor would probably argue, no, it's medicine, but uh, <laughs> but they, right. both, uh, they both have this uh, uh, the joy that you get when someone comes in in pain and leaves with a smile on their face is just yeah. the joy you get as it. And then as a, as in my leadership role, as I said, as a servant leader, what you look for is uh, how do I get other people to have the joy in uh, doing things that in some small way I've helped and they've been able to achieve and uh, how do they get, how do I make sure that uh, uh, the the team that we are all working together uh, feel that there's a there's a sense of uh, achieving something that uh, they deeply desired and wanted so it's a it's the same but it, it's a duality of a different uh, sort I mean, in one case it's the knowledge that is uh, that is causing it in the other case it's the uh, support encouragement and helping people be the best that they can be and I imagine that both of these are incredible vehicles for cultivating trust among your students, among your teams, among even those personally around you too. Correct, correct. And, and, the, and, and of course, that is, uh, again, a very important, uh, important step for any, uh, any of these things to work is that people must, you know, one of my former mentors here always said that the secret to leadership is, you know, if when things go wrong, take the blame and when things go well, give the credit. And if you can do that uh, repeatedly and well, then, you know, you'll get the trust that you're talking about and you'll get performance that uh, because people feel, you know, I certainly at the time when, when this individual was, uh, you know, mentoring me, I certainly felt I could do things because I knew that that's what would happen. And if you can do that consistently and well, not all of us can do it. Uh, everyone is still trying to do more and more of that. But if you can do that consistently and well, you get tremendous performance from people and help them to develop. I, I'm, I know that students and uh, leaders around you are grateful for the trust that you're cultivating and your joy is infectious in what you do. Uh, Professor Datar, thank you so much for joining us. I, I hope we can do this again down the road. All right. Thank you very much, Abhay. A pleasure. And uh, I hope I get a chance to see you in person uh, sometime soon. So thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Datar. And please check out all episodes of Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing, available at podcast outlets everywhere and at abhaydandekar.com. And as the Flight of the Concord said, we got down to business time, even all the way to our business socks. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Abhaydandekar.